Okay. Um, good uh, evening, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to, to welcome you to this seminar. I'm uh, very excited um, about, about today, the discussion and, um, and the, the, the speaker for today's seminar. Here's what I want to do before we get started. Um, in, a, in a minute, I will give the floor to Janneker, uh, and I believe that she will present uh, Governing Digital Society and explain why it's not only a research group at Utrecht University, but uh, the research group, um, and uh, will present our activities. Uh, and then I will introduce Daza, and uh, we'll tell you a, a little bit more about how we're going to structure uh, today's seminar. Um, and then the floor will be, will be yours, Daza. So without further ado, I will give you the floor, Janneke, uh, for, uh, for again, explaining uh, our group and uh, how we govern, govern digital societies. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Thibault, and um, warm welcome to, uh, to Desert Greenwood and to, uh, to all of you. Um, indeed, my name is Janneke Gerhardt. I'm Professor of Fundamental Rights Law um, at Utrecht University, and together with a number of other people, amongst whom is also Jose van Dijk, who is also present here today, uh, we form the, the board of this wonderful um, uh, research uh, focus area governing the digital society. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm not going to steal too much of your time because I know these kinds of opening words are always a little bit boring. Um, but I just would like to, um, to highlight and to give a little bit of uh, uh, context to um, today's, um, well, sh short webinar, lecture, uh, digital lecture kind of thing. Um, and indeed, uh, well, the context is that we do have this uh, focus area at Utrecht University. Um, and in fact, I, I always think it's, it's a rather posh term for just something uh, extremely important, uh, such as bringing researchers together who work at different faculties, who work in different fields, uh, but they are still all interested in, in doing research on similar shared uh, topics and, and fields of interest. And um, well, obviously the main topic that brings us together is this um, idea of governing our digital societies. And I think, well, the incident has just shown that there is great benefits to um, all these digital means, but there's also considerable risks and problems involved. And it's, it's the great challenge of our time to, uh, to deal with those, to make the most of the benefits and to somehow mitigate and reduce um, the risks that are involved. And um, well, whether we are data scientists or lawyers or economists or media scholars or governance scholars, we're all aware of this enormous impact. And I think together we could uh, really get further in, 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 in trying to find uh, possible solutions uh, for all those issues. And that's why I really like this idea that we, well, only recently, I think we're working on this since a few months in this uh, new setting of this focus area. Uh, but we've already achieved a considerable uh, collaboration, which I really like. It's very fruitful. Um, so it has brought us a lot of, of energy, new ideas, and um, also it has resulted in some funding. And that has, in turn, um, enabled us to, um, to institute some special interest groups. And we currently have six of them, um, and they all deal with very particular topics within this overall theme of governing the di digital society. Uh, so one concentrating on the platform society, we have one focusing on principles by design, uh, we have another on inclusion in the data fight city, um, a fourth one concerns uh, platformization of education, um, there is one on digital migration, and of course, and most importantly for today, um, the boats special interest groups um, works on, on the topic of blockchain for society. And even if those groups have only been in existence for just a few months, and we know it's not the easiest time for doing research, um, they are very active already. So they are very much involved in doing collaborative research. They've started building teaching programs and they are organizing extremely interesting events. And I think today's uh, webinar is a very good example of that. Um, so well, if you, want to know more about this, if you feel inspired by today's uh, session, um, I certainly could recommend uh, paying a visit to our website. Um, you can easily find that by using yet another digital means, just Google governing the digital society in Utrecht University, and you'll be sure to find it. Um, and I hope we could also welcome you to, you know, to, to future um, events that are going to be organized by this um, 
focus area or by one of the special interest groups. Um, so, well, that's just this little bit of, of background information. Um, and I think, um, well, we should now just quickly turn to the, to the real event for today, which is, I think, what we all have been waiting for. Um, so, Thibaut, can I just hand back to you to do the proper introductions? Sure, thank you very much. And I have to say, as a researcher, it's, it's indeed very exciting to be working with uh, all, the, all the different schools within Utrecht University. So it was a personal note, but, but it, we have such a good time. Um, uh, and indeed, the, the, the um, uh, special uh, group I'm, I'm uh, leading for governing digital society is focusing on blockchain. And today, I believe that DASA will be touching just probably a little bit on blockchain, but not necessarily. And the way I see the technology, and I believe that DASA shares the same view, is that blockchain is actually about the infrastructure, which is one of those potential infrastructure for, for the new world. It's not the only one, but it's interesting, I think, to, to think about it in terms of infrastructure on top of which you could build something. So now let me tell you a little bit about, about Daza, and uh, hopefully I will succeed in, uh, in uh, making him uncomfortable right now because I have a lot to say. Um, so Daza is a research scientist at the MIT uh, Media Lab where he is studying um, human, human dynamics. Uh, so this is something that I found somewhere on the MIT website and that I liked very much, so I thought I would use it. And indeed, again, it relates to the topic of today's talk, infrastructure so that human, human beings can actually behave and interact in a certain way. Um, Daza is also the founder of uh, civics.com, which is a uh, boutique uh, provider for professional uh, consultancy services uh, for legal technologies. And I have to say that, uh, and this is probably where I hope that I will blush a little bit, that Daza is also a great mentor to many of us in the, in the legal tech communities. I know, including for legal hackers, but, but not only. Um, and I believe that his work is bridging the gap between the law and computer science, among others. And so in, in, sort, in short, when I was presenting today's presentation, I thought, well, Daza is actually us in 20 years, right? This is hopefully what we can achieve in 20 years to bridge the gap between those two words, which are two constraints on our societies. Uh, very recently, he has been creating the uh, MIT Computational Law Report that you can find at uh, law.mit.eu. And so once again, I'm thrilled. I cannot wait for your presentation, Daza. The way we're gonna proceed is that you will first hear from him for, I guess, about 20 to 30 minutes. Then I will be doing a uh, fireside uh, chat with, uh, with Daza for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll open the floor to, to all of you for, for subsequent questions. So uh, without further ado, Daza, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that uh, generous um, introduction. And um, uh, I, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with you. Uh, Thibaut, who's been a terrific collaborator, uh, has told me so much about this group. And I'm excited to make your acquaintance. And I hope that um, after today, we'll find opportunities to collaborate or at least keep communicating. Um, uh, at MIT, I'm going to put on my my branding now. This is my MIT hat, so I'm speaking my capacity as a um, academic researcher at MIT today. And um, the URL um, is law.mit.edu. It sounded a little like you'd said law.mit.eu, but and that's certainly something that's in the realm of possibility in the future. We should we should talk about a collaboration, uh, maybe a. Uh, an outpost of MIT, um, but this one is EDU. And uh, there you can find the computational law um, research program and, uh, and especially this new publication we have called the MIT Computational Law Report, um, where we're beginning to provide some uh, platform for uh, people to socialize ideas and new research on um, how the law can be engineered uh, to um, ex be expressed as, uh, as, um, as um, basically applications um, online um, fed by data. So today um, I, I would like to talk about a 
a, a particular idea. Um, I'll do a little screen share. And, uh, can you see the screen? Great. Um, this particular idea is, um, uh, as Thibault foreshadowed, is uh, identifying something that, uh, that, that some of us think is missing um, right now uh, during what after all is still in a sense relatively early in a transition phase from uh, the industrial age to you know, what many call the information age. Um, and, and that is um, infrastructure, pu public infrastructure. And in the information age, that would be very much digital infrastructure. Um, so why do we think this is missing? Well, if you take a look back, um, barring from uh, Europe and environs now, but you know, uh, public infrastructure has been absolutely essential in, um, in, in traditional civilizations. You know, the aqueducts, uh, public spaces like coliseums, systems of roads, that have transformed um, society and the economy and in a sense uh, upon which civilizations have been founded uh, to, to pr basically providing um, providing um, that that undergirding uh, that that allows uh, people to communicate and to transact and to relate at large scale uh, without individual permissions um, so this is a, a, a fun little map that, that I've enjoyed, and it basically just expresses the, um, the system of Roman roads at the height of the empire um, as a subway map. <laughs> um, and what this is meant to convey, um, well, first, I just think it's a cool image, but, uh, but what would it mean to translate and refactor and apply this idea of truly public infrastructure into a, into a modern age uh, that, that, that is the, the next generation digital age. Um, so there's some precursors. Um, I think GPS is a very good example of a service that, well, it started quite constrained and, uh, for military and official use, but now it's generally available. And um, you know there's different flavors around the world, but it has made possible a great many um, things in navigation and uh, in commerce and and in society uh, and for individuals. Time is a service. Uh, the way that we know what time it is and can coordinate our servers and uh, can begin to do more fine-grained and coordinated scheduling of uh, events and tasks and activities uh, ex is, is expressed as a service, um, including through APIs, uh, application programming interfaces. Um, a little bit more niche here, but in the US we have the so-called do not call list and also uh, mobile number portability. These are um, these operate uh, the do not call list through a registry system and it's um, regulated um, and it allows um, anybody to um, identify themselves and their uh, uh, number or telephone numbers uh, to go onto a, a registry uh, that has some requirements, uh, including that um, that they not be, um, you know, uh, they have unsolicited commercial calls. Uh, this is a kind. These are sort of examples of um, of broad public systems that are, you know, these are very much digital systems, um, and the, but they don't. <laughs> they're not the same yet as these kinds of systems. So it seems like there are some things that are missing. So what might truly public infrastructure look like? Um, well, here's just a few ideas just to start a conversation. One thing that seems to be missing um, is, is a concept of like a log or a ledger. And I think that's a, you know, one way to to implement such a thing is certainly through blockchain or distributed ledgers. Uh, it's hardly the only way. In fact, that's still relatively new uh, technology, not yet really proven, especially at large scale um, and for the reliability uh, that infrastructure would need. But, but you can nonetheless imagine any number of ways using you know, hash technologies and, um, and APIs where you could provide, for example, a public 
digital timestamp service on a ledger that was available so that when an event happened of any type, uh, you could get a, basically enter it into the into a public log. Uh, you know, the, things like this could make available um, receipts, um, public notice, for example, um, or uh, um, RFPs, uh, lots of things which right now you would see through particular government um, proceedings, uh, you know, could be available, uh, not just for those um, few official acts and stratified and, you know, siloed across, you know, jurisdictions, you know, local and national, but actually for, for anybody to use. Um, public law is one where I really think Europe is much further along than the U.S. and most other um, countries uh, in, in, in other regions, but um, you know, being able to have law in a sense as a service uh, so that it would be possible using standards to um, you know, search, filter, sort, and even integrate um, legal rules that apply uh, across any jurisdiction and be able to have a sense of history uh, for inversioning of what rules applied at a given time and what rules are going to be, um, have an effective date in the future. You know, these things are not too hard to do on systems like, you know, GitHub, for example, or, or other uh, register API based systems. But we, we actually don't have access to law right now in a usable digital format. It's still a paper paradigm. Uh, but these rules very much govern our systems, uh, many of them do, and they, they can be expressed uh, increasingly uh, as code uh, that can be uh, discovered and ingested uh, for uh, systems that need to comply with that code or, or, or may want to leverage it. Identity is maybe the most interesting one, um, and it's one where um, I, I'm going to hasten to say public identity. Um, uh, there's serious privacy questions, but we already have digital identity. It just doesn't work very well. Um, and, you know, in the paper age, you know, uh, birth certificates, marriage licenses, um, death certificates, um, voter registration, you know, public licenses for lawyers and doctors. These are all examples where as a society, we've already made a decision that, you know, for good policy reasons, uh, we want this these facets of identity to be publicly available again that there's not a service for this like there's no easy way to identify oneself or to authenticate the identity of another for some of these public purposes same goes very much for businesses um you know i think google has filled a lot of this void um you know the, you can see you know coffee shops and businesses uh that have um that appear on Google Maps with some metadata and other information about them. There's a whole system that Google's uh, provided through uh, postcards and uh, and U.S. Ma and um, and mail uh, for businesses to claim their identity and to prove that they're the business at that address and therefore have um, like um, edit rights over like their store hours and things like that. Um, but wouldn't what what one might think that the authoritative source of the identity of a, of a business, for example, would be the government that incorporated that business um, and would say whether it's still in good standing or, or exists and who the authorized representatives of that business are. Um, you know, so when you look at just some of the issues like phishing attacks and, um, you know, or just being able to find a business and, and, and know that you're speaking to them, um, th this could all be addressed very easily if only the identity of the business were available in a standard way. This could be an example of a public infrastructural service upon which so many types of uh, interactions and transactions could be founded. Um, sort of like, you know, we put the roads out, um, but we don't say exactly what you need to do on the road or where you can go or for what purpose you can ride on the road. You can do it for any purpose. That's an, that's a, an indicia of infrastructure. You build, you know, architectures and specific um, uses on you, uh, on infrastructure, and that infrastructure has to be reliable and available um, to to enable that. Um, and then I'll just throw out the idea of a public square, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a place where people can assemble, uh, or can discuss, um, you know, perform, protest, um, celebrate. You know, if you think of the triumphs or the 
uh, or the um, the public squares in in physical and the forums uh, in in physical cities and and uh, environments, there's not really an equivalent in cyberspace now. We have these sort of very weird um, private spaces like Facebook and um, and others, but but where's the public square? Um, it wouldn't be that hard to have a um, infrastructure type service that allowed for some threaded discussion, um, some media sharing, a profile page, that type of thing. Um, and what could that make available? What could that make available? Um, so these aren't necessarily, <laughs> um, other than identity, I don't know that any one of these is is a you know is 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 of a type that's you know ready to go out and you know be built. But this is more these are examples of something that's missing uh, in order to successfully transition civilization itself to the digital age. You know some other more tangential things that have come up in meetings in our research group at MIT is dispute resolution as a service, uh, public education. Um, you know being able to um, identify your credentials uh, and skills and uh, put job postings out. Um, so again, this isn't for a particular company. It's more of a service type to allow people to match um, in a reliable standard way. Um, you know, some of the sorts of things you could do on that um, uh, public log or ledger service uh, could be individuals could post an RFP, say, you know, I'm looking to buy a house. I need like one or two bedroom house, you know, you know, within three miles of a school or something. And that could actually flip the market right now. It's very much a seller's market and people have these brokers going around trying to find people that might want to buy the house. If there was a way that people could express their intent and demand through a ledger um, at the consumer level, not just a big business with an RFP or a big government, that could uh, transform and uh, the very essence of markets themselves. Um, Transport hailing is another interesting one. So, right, you know, if you want to hail a taxi now, you, you know, most of them don't have apps in in the United States. Um, you have to call a telephone number or stick your hand out. And if you want to use an app, now you're in a walled garden, like for Lyft or Uber. Um, this could be a public service. Um, that this might be the type that could be a a sub service or an application built upon a public ledger, for example. So. So these are some um, some thoughts on on something that I believe is missing, uh, which is the, the notion of public infrastructure. And I guess I'll just end um, on a note um, described that connects it hopefully back to governance, um, which is um, when I was a young lawyer uh, in the mid '90s, uh, I worked for a state government, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as a technology council, uh, and one of the things we did was um, we um, we just we realized that we needed um, a sustained multi-year investment in our networks and information technology of a type that we couldn't really um, successfully manage um, in year-to-year -year budgeting uh, the way uh, government typically works, and we believe that some of this was in fact best understood as infrastructure, um, as like a capital project, you know, not so different from roads and bridges or, or, or a port. Um, and uh, we put together a bond, um, a, you know, as a, as a financing vehicle. We got, uh, I think in our case, it was Moody's was the bond rating agency that we worked with. And there was some convincing to do because no one had ever heard of an information technology bond before. But we convinced them that it was of the right type. And there was some back and forth, um, you know, getting like, you know, desktops and you know, mouse and uh, keyboards was not considered infrastructure, but some of the deep network and laying the pipe, you know, across the state for bandwidth and some of the other um, elements of, of, the, uh, of the IT was considered infrastructural. And uh, we got those bonds and were able to actually build out some of this service. And uh, they continue to do IT bonds. The, these are examples for public sector use of uh, capital project type um, bonded uh, infrastructure. But what about for society itself? Um, like we know how to build infrastructure that enables everybody to use it, public infrastructure. Where is it and what might it be 
in cyberspace. So th that is the talk that I'd like to engage in. Um, thank you very much, and I'd be delighted to, um, to discuss it. Yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I know it's cliche to say it's a lot of uh, food for thought, but I, I think in this case, it's a lot to think about. I think I thought it would make sense for me to ask you a few questions, especially since we've been working together. And um, hopefully I could, I could uh, direct our conversation in a way that will be helpful to, to everyone in the room and then to open the floor to everyone. So I do have four questions. If you want to disregard one of those, please just tell me. Um, the, I, I guess I will go and start with the end and then eventually go back to the very beginning of your presentation. The first question I add is the one related to identity. And indeed, and especially in the field of blockchain, we've heard a lot, right, about that idea of uh, protecting your identity, being able to display only the identity that you want. And something which to me is very interesting is that there are two different objectives which actually are quite opposite. On the one hand, you may want to protect your identity uh, and um, you know, to escape, for instance, the power of big companies or big government. And you, you may want to be able to do something in a way which is private. And on the other end, as you said, sometimes you, you do want to prove your real life identity, right? You may want to be able to do something and to say, yes, this is me. You can trust that this information is true. And and I know that the conversion between the two is really hard. And especially this is one problem that we see with uh, voting, right? And using blockchain for voting. How do you use it in a way which is private and then eventually uh, display your real life identity? So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, on what would be needed at the infrastructure level for this type of services or this type of uh, dual aspect will, could function in a way which is, which is efficient. Sure. Um, so I, I think that's, that question is uh, at last timely. Um, you know, people have talked about digital identity for a long time and all we've got is usernames and logins. And we've seen what happened in the first attempt to just have a Zoom call. It was immediately overrun by, um, by um, you know, uh, very disruptive, um, you know, unauthorized users of our network system. Um, it doesn't really work very well. We're getting neither security nor privacy with the um, patchwork of systems that do uh, kind of authentication right now. And really what's needed, I would say, is a way to push it down from every individual architecture of every system down to something that's more of a core service maybe an infrastructure type service that can support certain common um, interactions for identity uh, that can be consumed by lots of other applications and services. Um, and that we can maybe therefore invest and amortize um, higher security because now it's being leveraged a lot. And so having some inconvenience for two or three factor authentication across a lot of systems may make a lot more sense. And getting government involved in some ways is not necessarily bad. Um, uh, there's some suspicion or presumption that government is not a great go-to in the United States, but people like to have government for voting roles and for driver's licenses. Um, the idea of being able to leverage state or local governments as a place you could go to reclaim your identity if it were um, compromised, just as we do today, um, is one example of a, of, a, of a way that these things could connect. L let me show you um, something that I think is potentially promising um, as an example. Um, there we go. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Um, so here's something called My Colorado um, Digital ID. Um, this is, um, My Colorado, you know, is, is a portal uh, for the state government of Colorado. But th one of the things they've implemented is something called My Colorado Digital ID, um, which is basically an electronic um, verifiable representation of their state issued driver's license. And at least in the United States, uh, driver's licenses have become the, um, a very key, what we call breeder document or like a, a, a key um, core um, uh, uh, credential of identity. And, and there hasn't really been a, a way to represent that digitally up to now. This is one way, um, and they, you kind of, you uh, 
you know, the, the state can, uh, um, uh, if you download the app and you already have a driver's license that's been issued based on the enrollment and the, uh, the um, issuance uh, procedures that they have, you can basically represent that in, at, in, a, wa in a digital wallet on, on a phone and you can connect it with by taking another photo and doing a few other things, photo of yourself and a photo of the license and, you know, um, and, uh, and getting an SMS or a telephone uh, or an email uh, to, you know, basically link that to, to you. Um, they feel that that's sufficient to be a, a valid um, driver's license that you could show to the police if you're pulled over or something like that. In theory, you should be able to, um, um, show it as identity in a hotel uh, if, when you're uh, checking in or, or anything like that. Um, so this is, I'd say, is an example of um, of like a of of like a direct linear step of taking the existing identity infrastructure and just expressing it digitally. Um, another step that may be needed would be something that could ex that could uh, extract uh, that could uh, encapsulate it even further. Um, so something that could maybe operate across different jurisdictions and or maybe even in the private sector, like your employee, something that sources from you as opposed to is issued to you from a given um, a particular government. Some people have used the phrase self-sovereign identity for that. And there are blockchain uh, distributed um, IDs uh, as one way to uh, potentially implement this idea. Um, and I think there's still early days there, uh, but uh, this is a, a service type that I think is the right, you know, general category of, of how to address ID. And I think, you know, starting small and conservatively is the right way. You know, probably things like voting ought to be the last thing that, that's done, but we can do some things uh, iteratively and, uh, and correct as needed uh, to get there. Um, I guess the final thing I'd say is take a look at what Wyoming's uh, select committee on blockchain and I think it's like digital innovations doing. Uh, we have a hear they have a hearing uh, this coming Monday or Tuesday, um, and I've been helping them with digital identity legislation that creates some core definitions of this um, idea of an individual that has identity, you know, by which we consent to be governed or or, or by which we can choose to sign a contract and th these sorts of things, which all of which is increasingly happening online, uh, uh, as well as business identity. So we're creating some sort of legal primitives or legal like core definitions that they're then picking up in other parts of the statutes as they um, keep up with the digital transformation. Yes, and, and I mean, indeed, we see also the business implication, right? If you are able to log in into a social network, not using your account on that social network, but the identity provided by the state, potentially you could cut access any time, which means that in terms of uh, data valuation, it could change the game. So that's, I think that's a fascinating issue. And, it, and of course, it brings me to my, to my second question, which is, well, yes, but what about, and that's the issue we stumble upon when working together, right? What about government using that power to then abuse that power? I mean, you know, we thought that in, in the United States, it would be impossible. If, if I asked you the question five years ago, you probably would have said, well, I mean, come on, that's the United States. And potentially today, your answer will be a bit different, right? Especially in 10 days, depending on the results of the election. <laughs> so what, what would be needed, do you think, at the infrastructure level, once again, to prevent abuses from public power once they have all that information and once they control the infrastructure? Indeed. Um, so you frame the question uh, as um, identity that sources from the government. Um, and I'm, I'd like to distinguish that assumption a little bit from another possible way forward, which is identity that sources, uh, in, let's just say conceptually, from the people or, or from each person. And so uh, like in the United States, part of our political philosophy, you know, coming back from uh, John Locke and, and uh, Thomas Paine and others, is that, um, you know, we really were uh, rejecting the idea of um, kings and, and government as, as having some inherent or divine sovereignty. And we believed that um, the people um, are the source of sovereignty. And that we would create governments that um, that um, that we felt were fit uh, to govern us, and we and to be legitimate, they need to um, operate by the consent of the governed, and we can change them. 
uh, you know, and it's expected that there'll be change. We'll just make our best guess and give it a try and, you know, iterate. Uh, so the way that we expressed our identity back then was pretty simple. We show up at a town hall and, you know, you would raise hands, you would sign things in paper. How do we translate that to digital systems? So not change the idea, but express the idea digitally. Well, we have biometrics, you know, we have um, things that we know, we have factors of authentication. Uh, that's part of it. That's part of a mechanism. But there's an architectural question of, is there a way that people can ex express and maintain this, the authoritative source of their identity digitally? There are many ways we can do that. The question is, um, do we choose to do that? And do we have the courage to build and rely upon such systems? Yeah. Yeah, and I think indeed that's a fascinating distinction. Maybe I will ask you my third and fourth question together. So everyone, had, I'm sure everyone has lots of questions for you. I was, I was wondering, you mentioned API, and I think indeed that's, uh, you know, although it's an old technology, it's, it's key and very important. So I was wondering what you would think are, again, what is needed at the infrastructure level for those API to function as they should and in a very efficient manner. And the fourth question was regarding the tools for transforming information into data, because you mentioned a lot of uh, that issue of data. So I was wondering if you have a few that you like to use or what's the direction. So that will be my, my last questions for you before I open the floor. Certainly. Yeah, so very, thank you. Those are critical, um, practical questions, I would say. And so the, the first thing to note is that um, there, there's such a thing as an API um, and we need them. Um, application programming interfaces make possible um, uh, kind of um, uh, um, access to data and applications that, that can be agnostic to one domain or one silo or one business or one government. Um, you know, they're, they, they, they just, um, they're just a programming interface that lets you uh, do it like a, a, a request and, 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 uh, and, uh, and a reply uh, of data. And, and, and we, we need to do a better job of thinking in terms of APIs as opposed to a person navigating to a website and doing a search or clicking and then downloading a PDF. Yes, this is digital, um, but it's not, um, but it's still a paper paradigm. Um, so once we can start to take that information and express it as a service through an API, according to, 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 your sec, to the final fourth question, standards, some kind of schema or uh, like a JSON schema, for example, uh, so that you know what the structure of the data will be, uh, can be published so that anybody can program an application or a service to interoperate with these APIs. So one example that I really like is um, on structured data is uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, uh, in the US that um, governs publicly traded companies. Um, for uh, the quarterly filings uh, of their finances and uh, material contracts and other disclosures they have to make, uh, those can all be uh, submitted and, there, and companies are encouraged to submit them in XBRL format, um, extensible business reporting language. It's just a structured data format that lets, that, that sort of, um, uh, that, that allows them to express all of the uh, disclosures they have to make. Um, this is good. And that's a government agency that has a regulation that identifies what the schema will be in the taxonomies in a place that anybody can find. So it's like you know, government knows how to say this is the API and this is how you can comply with the law. Use this API to do your filings. Um, it works really well when the data is available, marked up with XBRL. Oh my, it is so good. Um, like we have discovered so much. Check out the next release of the MIT computational law report for some terrific applications in data science that Professor Dan Katz and his team have done on um, securities and exchange filings that, that are uh, expressed as data. Um, we can do that in other areas of, of life as well and other parts of government. It's a design pattern. We simply need to do it. All right, well, thank you very much. And, and of course, I guess one of the issue would be how do you translate democracy and uh, human rights into into data right eventually it will be asking us some very important questions i believe 
Uh, so now we'll open the floor to the audience. So I guess the easiest way, I do not see any question in the chats. If you do have a question, just unmute yourself and ask your question. And otherwise I have lots of questions, but I'm sure you do as well. Oh, I see one question. Can you, maybe I will, do, yeah, do you want to read it out loud maybe? Okay. Um, what could condition, what could be conditions for interoperability between infrastructural systems uh, that are currently owned and operated by a variety of private companies, which could turn them into reliable and efficient public infrastructures? Um, for instance, the condition that individuals can control their own identity attributes and personal data. Well, um, Jose, is it? Uh, the, the person who asked the question, I think you kind of answered it in the beginning, like one condition for identity, I think, would be that the, the, the best one I can think of is, is to situate the authoritative source of identity with the people themselves and to structure accordingly. But there are some other very practical conditions as well. So one thing is, um, I do think government is very critical for public infrastructure. Like all, all of the stuff I showed you from Rome and all the, infra, the, the public infrastructure I've ever been involved with, um, you know, as government is either, either the, the sole or a very important public private partner in, in the financing and the um, building and the deployment and the management and the governance uh, and responsibility for that infrastructure, setting the rules, uh, making decisions. Um, and so, you know, one thing, one type of condition that could be helpful would be legislation that creates like a quasi public entity or, or that designates um, government authorities and gives them authority to um, float bonds and to um, and to identify the governance and uh, and what the rules of the road would be in order to build such things. Uh, I think that would be a very important uh, precondition to the build out of public infrastructure. Not, I guess one way to look at the question is, what are the conditions for the build out of public infrastructure in physical space? And a lot of those are going to apply in cyberspace. Thank you very much. Anybody else? So maybe while you think about your question, I will ask you another one. Uh, it seems to me, and I know this is certainly true in the US, actually the Netherlands is one of the few exceptions all over Europe, but it seems that there is a trust issue in our institutions, right? There is a trust issue between individuals, but also in our relationship with the state and the government. So my question is, is, is now the right time for implementing these kind of infrastructures, especially public ones? And I guess I could ask the question a bit differently. What do you think will be the impact if we manage to implement some of those infrastructure? What would be the impacts on our relationship with the states and our trust level with the states? How do you envision all that? So now is not the time. Uh, now is, it's not too early to begin discussing this and thinking about it, talking about it, debating uh, in a serious way. Uh, what would be the first one or two or three public digital infrastructures that would be most needed, most achievable, you know, highest value, most ready, best fit, you know, um, and so forth, uh, most realistic uh, for sure. And I would imagine, you know, if things unroll well, uh, maybe as early as three to five years could be, you know, good timing to begin building some of these things out provisionally and seeing how they go. Um, you know, public infrastructure is a decades kind of, you know, game. It's not a, you know, weeks and months or even few years kind of thing. And that's completely appropriate uh, to make it so simple. Uh, what, how could such things uh, change the relationship of, uh, of people to the state? Um, you know, m my basic sense, and this is a little conservative, I'll, I'll admit, is um, I think a good starting point is no change. Like, how about we just achieve a successful transition of the existing systems to a digital age, just without leaving our values or capabilities out, like maintaining them intact, but now they're occurring legitimately digitally, which they are not now. Um, most of it is missing. Um, 
you know, uh, and then we can begin to, you know, think, you know, update, like it or not, the social compact and the political compact is always evolving um, and it will continue to evolve. Uh, and I think there'll be dynamics that I'm not sure I can guess uh, that will be different uh, as a result of uh, these things occurring in digital environments. Uh, but I'd say the, the real priority now is to successfully transition. Um, and I guess one thing that could be different is, you know, things may happen faster in some ways, uh, you know, um, and, you know, perhaps having some bulwarks or some like artificial like time periods for change as part of change management and governance may be appropriate for certain political, uh, um, you know, fluctuations to manage those. Yes. And, and I mean, to me, it's always, it's always interesting. I remember going back to the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post archive and to enter the keyword uh, cyberspace or internet back at the beginning of the 90s to see what they were writing about it. So, of course, part of the press was saying, well, the internet is for pedophiles and terrorists and that's it. Uh, and the other part was saying, well, it might change something. But what they saw at the time is that it will change the speed at which we exchange information. But, but almost no one saw that it will change also the nature of information, right? So potentially, if the infrastructure we've been describing will change not information, but, but transactions and, be, and uh, the way we interact with one another, it will also change the nature of that. And of course, it's really hard to see, right, to some degree. But I see we have another question in the chat. Do you believe that it will be possible to create the transnational cyberspace public infrastructure? And if not, how can we prevent, oof, yes, that's a very timely question. How can we prevent di dividing, dividing the, the cyberspace into smaller parts governed by different governments? Indeed. Um, so if we just take identity as an example, uh, one can imagine um, like core identity services that allow you just to identify who, who you are uh, when you want to, uh, not necessarily to have it uh, used without consent for mass surveillance, but when you want to identify yourself, like to log into an application, for example, uh, or to sign a contract, um, these types of things, as opposed to being put into a, um, a pen of a, of a given application like WeChat or Facebook or DocuSign. Um, this is an example of something that, you know, through treaties and through international conventions, like, you know, like maritime law, um, I think, um, uh, you know, can be, um, designed and, and implemented in a way that is um, global and trans, transnational by design. Uh, uh, and then, you, you know, different countries will appropriately have different rules of the road about like, well, how does WeChat operate? <laughs> um, and how does Facebook operate? Um, this is a higher level of architecture that can be built on underlying infrastructure. The question is, what are the core infrastructural services that people need as we are alive in the digital world. And it brings me actually, it made me think about another question, which is what should we do as academics? Where should we start? And I guess potentially the first thing that comes to my mind is that probably we should share knowledge and explain which type of infrastructure. And actually we know that the Chinese government is putting lots of money into creating a new infrastructure right for the web. But do we want to use it? Do we trust it? Well, I'm not saying that the answer is negative or positive, well, but at least- I can say the answer is negative. No, negative. we do not. Yes, well, it seems to be negative, but it's very important for not only us, but for everyone to understand why the answer is negative. And that will be very complex, right? To some degree. And I know we've been discussing the, the uh, Facebook documentary, the uh, social dilemma, saying, well, on the, one, on the one hand, it's great because it, it puts some very interesting questions to the public. On the other hand, maybe you do not need to be so biased and to disregard part of the story. So what do you think is our role as academics? How can we approach those issues? Yeah, the, the, the best way to, uh, well, I think some of it is philosophy, logic, research, debate, um, allowing a marketplace of ideas. But, you know, another perfectly good role of academia is research. MIT is a research institution. We're always building things. We're prototyping things. We're putting ideas in action into the world. 
um, I'd say a really good thing to do, especially using open source that makes it possible to quickly propagate and test ideas is to build things and uh, that reflect ideas of how things could and maybe should be. Um, and, and to get as many of those out as possible and to build partnerships and to allow uh, laboratories of innovation and democracy to blossom. All right, well, it sounds like a plan. Do, do we have any, any further question? I think otherwise it's about time and I know you are a busy man. So let me just wait for five more seconds. If there Thank is you any very much question, for the opportunity. Uh, and it's terrific to, to make the acquaintance of your team and I hope that we can maintain the connection. Well, I hope as well. Any, anyone, just unmute yourself, but I guess it's about time. It's no, all right. Um, well, again, I have lots of questions, but I guess the conversation is to be continued. Uh, so on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for joining us. I hope indeed we could collaborate and, and build, right? Um, a great article has been published recently um, saying that it's time to build. And I think this is very much true. And I know you agree with that. So um, again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I wish you a great day. What time is it for you? 1 p.m., right? 1 p.m. All right. For, for us, it is 6 p.m. So it's time for dinner, as you know, in the Netherlands. <laughs> bon appetit. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good day and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.